um, celebrities and bands and stuff like that, and it goes up online. That's part of what Gosh TV is, but, but there's more to Gosh our TV. Company. Pardon me, our company, huh? Yes. I have my own head <laughs> <laughs> This is 
pretty weird stuff because uh, everything is callback based. So uh, you'll make a call to read where you expect it to block until, until you read something and it doesn't work that way. You call out to read and then it continues on its merry way uh, without waiting for any reply. And there's a callback method that you've registered previously that says, uh, you know, when something happens on that read, call back to this function and with the data, and then I'll do something. So you kind of have to turn inside out uh, some of your thinking uh, about how to handle uh, communications like it, because nothing ever blocks, nothing ever waits, nothing ever stops. The, you know, it's always just immediately going forward uh, from any networking call, and you don't know until later if it failed or not. So that presents an interesting challenge. Then we have HTML5 web sockets. Um, you want HTML5 because the client is portable everywhere. The, um, the, the old way is to, do, is to use Flash and to use regular sockets. And there's a, there's a uh, little socket server trick that, that lets you serve this stuff up so Flash will, will, will recognize the ordinary sockets as, as an IO connection. Uh, it's actually a Ruby script that does that. But um, with Flash, you, you have a lot of difficulty in making that work uh, cross-platform. It can be done, uh, but uh, HTML5 from the get-go is designed to be cross-platform. It's JavaScript, but it doesn't talk sockets. It only talks web sockets. So whatever socket library you use, you have to have this extra layer of web sockets on top of it. Uh, which is basically this extra protocol that uh, makes a uh, live side connection look uh, something like an HTTP connection. And then uh, the last bullet on my slide was was uh, that's not really, really cool. uh, was uh, uh, using SQL or, or no SQL uh, that you want to have some sort of database uh, connection that handles all this because. Um, with hundreds of thousands of users on board, you need uh, quite a database to uh, keep track of everything that happens. And if you're playing uh, uh, money games, then there's a tremendous amount of accounting involved as well uh, to make sure that nothing uh, goes where it should not go. So uh, the, uh, the basis of these of these servers, and I worked on a, on a server for the Navy. Well. The, the, the military, the Navy and the Army. I, I, was, I was a Navy employee, but it was actually built for the Army. Uh, but uh, the system was a, uh, was a first person shooter game uh, where everything was, was, was mil spec, everything was realistic uh, within the game. We had the actual Apache attack helicopter specs and the actual uh, M1A Rivers tanks uh, specs and things like that. And uh, that actually use the same architecture. Uh, so it's been around a long time to have these packet-based uh, game systems where basically everything is kept in state in the server, everything is kept in state in the client, and, and these packets are passed back and forth that's, that, that are basically requests to do something. Like, you know, I'm firing at these coordinates, and sending that packet to the server, and the server is saying, okay, well, this object is destroyed, and send a packet back, and, then the client saying, oh, well, okay, you know, that object was destroyed, I have to update my screen and, you know, blow up that aircraft or whatever it was. And so these packet passing systems are, are, have been the norm for a long time uh, in uh, these game, in these massively multiplayer online game systems. But it's uh, a little more interesting when you get uh, in for the further constraint you want everything to be asynchronous and so forth. So I've already talked about that we've got to cope with the one cycle per player. Uh, what we really don't want is one thread per player, uh, you know, which is why we can't be blocking I.O. Because if, if we were going to block, we would, we would need to have another thread that wasn't blocked, and we would uh, run out of threads. But then we'd also like to insert of RAM per player, but that's something that you want to do anyway. Uh, and then another thing that may not be obvious off the bat is you want to avoid lookups on every pack that uh, you could keep, and probably will keep, actually, uh, a table, a map uh, of, uh, that, that, uh, can, that goes from socket IDs uh, to uh, the uh, actual player object in, in memory 
<coughs> set the right patent the right way or things like that. But you prefer not to look at on every patent to do that because um, you know you could get into a fair amount of overhead doing that. So um, to avoid this, uh, in your asynchronous IO, you'll actually try to map back to the individual object uh, that is that sign connection. So it goes straight to that and you don't have to do a look at Okay, so with packet processing, we're going to process each packet twice. Uh, the reason that we're processing it twice is, as I just mentioned, uh, you have the callback that comes straight to the object uh, because that's working, you know, because that's more efficient. But you don't want to process that packet at, at the point that you take it off of the network. Uh, for one thing, there are all sorts of locking scenarios and things that probably aren't where you need them to be. And the other thing is you want to get off of your network IO thread just as quickly as possible. Uh, you don't want to do a lot of processing there because you want to, uh, to free up your network IO to do something else. So uh, you're going to unpack the packet enough that you know what the thing is, and then uh, we're going to, to poke the this pointer, for those of us in C++, uh, into the packet. Just, just have, a, have, a, have a null pointer sitting there. Then when we get the packet, we'll point this into it. So that when we put this on the message button, we pull it back out again. We've already got the visible here and don't have to do a look at that we would not like to do. So uh, the way these packets are laid out, uh, uh, all the games pretty much work this way, at least the ones that I've worked on. Uh, there's, a, there's a header that will have uh, some sort of, uh, 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 usually it has two codes. One, it has a major code and a little subcode. And so the major code can be like, you know, this is a this is a poker game and the person is playing. And within that the subcode can say, and this person is making a bet, or this person is gonna call, or this person is folding, uh, you know, all of the of the kind of subcategories of, of that type of play that you can think of. So uh, we've unpacked the, the packet. We also have to unpack the packet body, uh, which is various C++ types and things like that. Um, you know, this, this is just marshalling. You know, we have to unmarshal the data, which is very common to anyone who's done kind of programming and things like that. Okay, so in the network IO thread, we've got the packet unpacked a little bit, so we know what the thing is. Uh, we're getting we're conveniently inside of our object already because we're clever about putting a callback to the object that this packet belongs to. So we're going to put the this in the packet. Uh, then we're going to push this on to a message queue that is going to do the real processing of this packet. We're not going to do anything with the packet except just unpack it at this point. And if, unless we have some custom data structure, uh, we're going to have to put locks around this so that we don't smash up our, our message queue. So uh, now we're done in, in the networking I.O. and this is just going on all the time, pushing these packets onto our message pump. So then over the message pump thread, uh, it's going to wake up. Uh, I, I didn't uh, put the signal, uh, I didn't know that we were doing a signal work. Obviously, we've got to signal the pump to wake up when there's a, there's a new packet on. Uh, and again, we'll have to lock because now we're going to take the packet off the queue. We don't want the queue for doing that. And then once we get the packet off, we can conveniently call this route. And uh, since we're already inside our object, it just magically goes off and does everything that we want our object to do. It's, it's fabulous C++ object programming that uh, we're all familiar with. And as I mentioned before, if we want to do this lockless, which uh, we really might, uh, we're going to do some kind of custom container uh, where we put things on one end and take them off the other in such a way that, that we don't step on uh, our queue and, and, and cause queue corruption uh, by having a simultaneous operation. Actually, another server, but uh, this server will run you know, thousands of client sessions and mimic uh, the exact same communications protocol uh, that you would have if you had an interactive client. So you could be load testing in your server or to populate it with robotic players, whatever you want to do. And so it was very important to be able to have an architecture that worked with client and server. Uh, asynchronous uh, regular sockets and web sockets. So we ended up with Boost uh, ASIO and uh, WebSocket uh, PP, which turned out to be very nice. Uh, we're uh, very
very pleased that uh, we made that choice. So, then going ahead to databases, uh, we start out in MySQL, we migrated to a cluster to get better performance, of course. Uh, the nice thing about MySQL uh, clusters is you can develop just using plain old MySQL and change your mind later. It doesn't really uh, show up in the database. And there is, when you create the tables, you have to save other cluster tables in that. Uh, so there's one little tweak that you have to make and confirm your data over. But uh, stuff pretty much works, except that uh, the cluster doesn't support foreign keys. So if you have foreign key dependencies in the data, you have to uh, take those out in order to make it happen in the cluster. I, I think they're fixing that, or maybe they even fix that. I haven't kept track because we already took all the foreign keys out, so we don't care anymore. Um, the cluster is more to admin, but they've actually improved that uh, quite a bit. I'm told uh, that uh, the next time we're going to install it, it won't be such a nightmare. Uh, and then uh, a lot of places are going to NoSQL uh, because it may scale better and the things that you need to query for games uh, typically are very SQL-ish. You don't tend to do a lot of intricate joins and things like that. But you're basically just putting things in and taking them out, which NoSQL databases are, are very good at. Okay, so uh, just to review how the, how the platform is set up. Uh, the modern client is HTML5 JavaScript. Uh, we also have a legacy client that is Flash ActionScript, and these both talk the same protocol, except one is talking sockets and the other is talking WebSockets, because you only have WebSockets when you're in HTML5. Then uh, the server is C++ Boost, uh, converted from what was originally 150,000 lines in Java code. I haven't I actually put the code cover on it lately, but I think we're down to like 50,000 lines of code, even though we have much more functionality and much more error checking than we had when we started, uh, just because uh, we've been able to improve algorithmically uh, a lot of things that were not coded in, in the most efficient way. Uh, you know, cut and paste uh, can really make code a lot bigger than necessary. So, uh, Something I do that is sort of unique in this, in this area is that I develop on all platforms simultaneously. Uh, most people pick a platform and stick with it. Uh, we picked free SB, we, we picked free BSD when we started on this project for performance reasons. But in the meantime, Linux improved, and so now we're running on Linux. Uh, but I really prefer debugging with Windows. I like the, the Visual C++ debugger better. Uh, so I end up developing everything on Windows and then deploying it on, on Linux or FreeBSD or Windows too if people actually are crazy enough to want that on their server. Um, and uh, the way that I do this is that I have a little library called uh, Lightning with Standard uh, that I wrote that uh, basically uh, just connects up the POSIX bits of Windows with the same thing in Linux. Uh, many people don't realize that uh, the BSD sockets are actually natively supported in, in Windows and, and the pieces that would be that you would that supporting them would imply you also support. Uh, but they all have different names and they have the regular files and, and it's just, you know, it's like, you know, could they have made it difficult? You know, it's like, you know, all that functionality is there except for time of day. Time of day is the only thing that's like absolutely missing from that. The time of day is actually quite trivial to write. Uh, so I built this little library that I stick on top of everything that I do so that I can write everything Linux style. Um, the only thing that is notable that, that this will not allow me to do is fork, but I don't want to fork anything, I want everything to be threaded, so that's no restriction at all. So I'm testing local host on Windows, I've got MySQL running, I've got Visual C++ running, I've got the debugger run, running, my, my, my little laptop is just going, ah, and, you know, and, and, and you know, maybe some robots running to, to load up the, the you know, so that I have some, some players to test against. Uh, and then uh, I should build uh, a virtual box uh, on my Windows box uh, so that I don't have to upload source code to the, to the web so I can you know, it's more of a security thing, you know, like, well, you know, maybe I don't want to have the source out on the web somewhere. Um, and then I have this very kind of crazy, auto-recursive make file that I invented. And what happened was, 
as, as you recall, I inherited 150,000 lines of Java that uh, were converted pretty much one to one file wise to C++ originally. Uh, and so that resulted in like a thousand files to compile. And I had no make file because Java doesn't use make files. And so I was facing the prospect of a week of work creating, you know, laboriously writing a beautiful make file. And we just we couldn't afford it. We, couldn't, we didn't have a week to, to, to make a, a make file. And so I said, well, I'll call my friend who's a rocket scientist. Now I have a friend who's an actual rocket scientist. In fact, a rocket scientist. In fact, he's out launching his rocket this week. I can't. If I needed to call him for advice, I would not be able to reach him because he's launching this, this rocket this week. Um, he, he's gone over to the commercial site. He's got a commercial rocket that he's launching this week. Uh, when, when I met him, uh, he was the uh, flight uh, software engineer for Mars Pathfinder. So he's the first. Uh, programmer to successfully land uh, a, a spacecraft on Mars. So he's pretty good. When I have, when I have a problem that <laughs> I, I feel like maybe I'm kind of stuck on, uh, I'll call up my friend Steve and say, hey, uh, I've, got, I've got a problem for you. Yeah, but he does the same. Sometimes a little problem, you just can't well, get it. He'll sometimes call me, but uh, <laughs> the, the thing about Steve is he, comes, he came up to the the Jet Propulsion Laboratory culture, and, and he's done everything old school. I, I'm, I've come up in more of a mad traditional route. Uh, and, and so sometimes it's, it's very interesting to, to see the tape that he'll have on something that, you know, you can go way back, you know, if, if, there's, if there's no modern solution. And, and that was actually what he did this time. He said, well, okay, so you need a huge copy of make file, but you need it today. Okay, so I've never, Steve had actually never done this, but he thought it was hypothetically possible that you could write a make file that would grind down through every subdirectory and just build everything in the directory. And then at the end, you could have this, you know, and not build any libraries, not, not archive anything, just, just grind down, and, and, as, and as it's grinding through all these directories, be moving the object files over into one directory, and then uh, at the end, just do a big bang link, and, and you'd have your CDU. And sure enough, that works. So, and, and it, it's not a very, you, you know, it has no dependency. So if you, if you change something, you're, you're out of luck. You need to build the whole thing unless it's like really small and you understand what to build yourself. Um, but most of the time, because I'm building Windows and testing everything in Windows, by the time I come to this point, I'm done. So I, I don't need, you know, I've got to do a big bang build anyway. You know, it doesn't gain me anything to have all the dependencies. So we're still using it, you know, a year later, even though we were sure that we would like take a week and really do the right engineering. Like that. It still works. Yeah. So uh, then uh, uh, take the SD rule up to our uh, to uh, Linux or FreeBSD, where I've installed it uh, as a service, so I can do start and stop and all that good stuff on it. And that's the platform. Next. Go or it didn't go. Here we I hit it. Oh, it's over. We're done. Oh. <laughs> Back to America. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, um, for those of you that, that want to do some further research, uh, if you search on C10K on the web, there's all kinds of interesting literature about how to deal with the socket problem. People are now working on having uh, 500,000 open sockets on a Linux box. Is, is, um, you know, the, the level that people are uh, working on right now, so it keeps getting bigger and bigger. Uh, we're, we're well past C10K. Um, and then if you search on Boost uh, ASIO, you'll learn about the Boost a asynchronous I.O. library, which is really cool. And uh, it's a little crazy because it also offers synchronous I.O. And it's very confusing when you go read the docs because it's like sometimes you're talking about synchronous and sometimes you're talking about asynchronous. And you're like, could you just pick one? You know, it's just like, <laughs> I'm only going to do one at a time. Uh, and then uh, WebSocket PP, uh, which is pretty obscure, I, I had a harder time finding that uh, because WebSocket stuff is all brand new. People are, there, there's, there's, a, there's a land rush right now to port things over uh, to HTML5 because it's just become uh, prevalent enough that it runs everywhere and is reliable and mostly works. And, you know, so it's, it's the flavor of the web. So, you know, everyone's like chasing websites as a result of that. Um, 
And then HTML5, of course, there's, there's all kinds of great literature on the web on that. Uh, something I didn't get on my slide uh, that I really want to give a shout out to is the Boost ASIO book. Uh, that's by John Tweecher, uh, and it's fabulous. And you can download it off the internet and all that good stuff. Uh, the uh, the, the uh, documentation of Boost uh, ASIO on the web uh, is not very tasty. It's really tough sledding. Uh, I really recommend that, uh, that you get the book in, in this particular case. Um, then, if anyone wants to buy one, get a standard uh, thingy. I will send that to somebody. Uh, but most people are not uh, inclined to develop on Windows for Linux. But I like it. And if anyone else wants to join me, uh, I, I will help them do so. And there's my contact with you. And actually, before we really started, we forgot to ask. How many are doing games? How many are thinking about doing I games? I didn't do that. We can do all that now. <laughs> <laughs> we should have done it first, but let's do it now. So how many people are developing games or thinking of doing a game server? <laughs> no. <laughs> 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 <laughs>